Will you pray with me? Touch us today in a way that lasts forever, dear God of all love and grace. Touch us so we know your tender love. Amen. So now what am I supposed to say? <laughs> it's not like being Lutheran is simple. Complexity and tension are two of our biggest things. In one of my interviews with the bishop's office, they said, why do you think you should be Lutheran? And I said, because Lutherans know how to live in the tension. And in these times when everything is polarized, where you're either this or that, Luther's and been, Lutherans have been there all along. We are all broken and all completely forgiven. We are all sinners and all saints. We are undeserving on our own, but totally righteous in Jesus. Now my life was 50 years of learning and struggling and wondering who I was and how to become more of who cre God created me to be. And then four years of seminary, and then a year of internship, and now here I am. And I am yearning to sum it all up in 12 minutes or less. <laughs> I want desperately to say something that will make you remember me that will make you understand what I have been saying all year, something that will show you Jesus. But I can't do it. I can't make you hear or believe or understand, and I certainly can't keep a straight face when I think that remembering me is really all that important in the grand scheme of God's love. The best I've been able to hope for all year is that you will come and see and then I've had to turn it over to God to trust that the Holy Spirit will turn my words into whatever they need to be for you individually and as a congregation. To trust that when I focus on Jesus, that focus will come to you as well through the Holy Spirit. To trust that somehow my words will have a positive influence even if it is in some way that I never know and cannot possibly understand. And on the whole, that is a pretty vulnerable position because my task, as taught to me in seminary, is to proclaim the gospel as a preacher. And yet at the same time, that that proclamation doesn't happen because of me, the proclamation is accomplished by someone else. It is accomplished by the Holy Spirit. It requires a lot of trust and courage, but fortunately, the Holy Spirit has proven time and time again to be completely faithful. So those were my thoughts when I went to read Paul's words from, to the Ephesians in today's texts. Paul said, I bow my knees to the Father, and I thought, me too, not to the government, not to the North Carolina Synod or even the ELCA, but only to God, from whom every family on earth and heaven takes its name, the name of human, whether North Dakotan or Texan or North Carolinian, Mexican or Afghanistani or Ugandan, old or young, or as for most of us, somewhere in between. We are all all one body, all one family, all gods, all equal in God's eyes, all equally worthy of love and grace and redemption, and all equally redeemed in Jesus. It is not possible to think of a single person who is not dearly beloved by God. I think most of you would agree with me on that. But I want you to take a minute, try and think of somebody who maybe God loves more than they love you. Or maybe somebody that God loves less than, they love, than God loves you. Think about it. Take a minute. I'll be quiet. So if you thought of somebody, I'm here to tell you 
That person is exactly as beloved as you are. That person is not loved more than you. That person is not loved one iota less than you. We are all loved just the same, infinitely. God's infinity for all of us. It is God's glory, God's richness. And God's richness is nothing like our richness. God's glory is so very different than the things we glory in. Turns out, the men's softball team, they're going to be in the championship game on, on Monday or Tuesday night. And if they win, that will be a great moment of glory. And it will be nothing compared to what God brings to us every day in our weakest moments. Those riches, God's riches, are the ones that I want for you. To know that you are so beloved of God, to be able to live into the job of being siblings to every other person and congregation on earth, even the ones, maybe especially the ones, that do not look or talk or act or even believe like you do. To revel in the fact that God's riches are not specific to you or to me, but they are generously and graciously for all of us, the people in this room and all of the billions of people outside of this room. I want you to have strength in your inner being as individuals and as a congregation wor worshiping in multiple assemblies, holding to what is important, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the love and ministry that flow from that resurrection gift. That might include feeding people, as in brown bag ministry, as Elisha fed his hundred people in our lesson today, as Jesus fed 5,000, working that all may have safe housing, seeing injustice, and wherever you see it, no matter how tiny or how big, that you do what you can to change it, not for your own benefit, but for the benefit of the community, the larger community, the community of God. I want Jesus to dwell in your hearts so that your balance, your decisions, your priorities are all rooted and grounded in love. In love, not fear. In love, not finances. In love, not even knowledge or logic. As Paul prayed for the Ephesians, so I pray for you that when the Holy Spirit comes and whispers to you, or maybe shouts because you never know what the Holy Spirit's going to do, that you will receive growing comprehension, not of theology books or engineering concepts or how to brew coffee or carpentry or gardening or accounting, although all of those are fine and excellent things, I might say especially brewing coffee, but comprehension of love, God's love, the love demonstrated by Jesus, the love that is greater than knowledge, greater than common sense, greater than the rational ideas of what we can afford or how we count the costs, greater than our anxieties about whether loving everybody might be a little inconvenient, greater than our fears that if we share with others, we might not have enough for ourselves. Loving enough to realize that God's richness comes to us through love and that you cannot outgive God. And if you think you can, go ahead and try. Try with everything you have to outgive God because it will be the most gracious love that you will ever feel. In the coming months and years, I will be listening, listening for news of the ways that you accomplish more than you can imagine now because of God's fullness. I'll be listening for the ways that you become more than you can even think to ask for because the Holy Spirit will blow through your individual and collective lives. I will be listening for the ways that you become more 
and more and more and more of who you are created to be and do so because of increased comprehension of what it means for you, for you, that Jesus lived and died and then lived again. Because Jesus lives now, Jesus will come again. Because Jesus is getting all the glory, Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit because Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father are living in perfect community, and that perfect community has rubbed off on the St. Philip community in all kinds of new and delightful ways that I pray you do not lose. After today, I will no longer be your vicar, but if I have done my job even remotely well, you will encounter other voices, and you will think, hmm, that sounds familiar. Not because it sounds like my voice or my words, but because you are hearing the call of the Holy Spirit. And when you hear that familiar voice, I pray that you will give the best and only appropriate response, that you will love all the people that God loves. Now may the joy and peace of a risen and living God and Savior be with you always. Amen.